Hi, people at home. Uh, we're just quickly going to do the attendance here. And then uh, so let me know in the chat if you're present. And uh, then we'll get started. Okay. Megan, Emily, Julia, Claire, and Caleb. Miles, Carly, Elfix, Nolan, Carson, Andy, and Alicia. Jack. Don't forget, guys, that if you're at home and you're supposed to be here, so you're in cohort B, but you're at home, that you just, a parent has to call in and validate your absence. So I, there's no way for me to mark you present. I, I record that you're here online, but I just I can't record that for the school. Like there's no place for me to let them know that you're uh, observing from home uh, until somebody calls in, and then they give me a spot where I can say yes, this person has attended virtually, and they're supposed to attend virtually. So, so just so you know. Okay, let's talk about what we're going to do today. For all the people here, welcome back. You made it just in time to go home in two days <laughs> for the break. Uh, I guess that's kind of nice. The, um, uh, a number of people have had questions about um, strategies for recording and stuff like that. I think everybody's here that contacted me, so we'll talk about that. We'll have an opportunity to chat today. I'll see if I can get you set up for the project. Um, we're we're going to be working on some independent stuff in the in the first block, and then in the second block, uh, we're going to do a little note together on the circulatory system, and uh, oh, probably a heart dissection. I'm going to try and slip it in. We'll see. I, th I think pretty sure I have a heart. I'll have to go and check. A uh, pig heart, anyway. I have a heart. Uh, okay, let's throw this one. Okay, so in learning block one, uh, the first thing you're going to do is finish off the notes package from respiration. So the only part that we didn't do was the very last page of the respiratory system booklet which is down here. 
Uh, and this is all about lung capacity. So this is this you're going to do on your own. You're, um, you use page 443 in, in your textbook for this. And essentially, this is these are the different ways that you can measure the amount of air that is in your lungs. Okay. This the um, the the diagram at the bottom does a really good job of summarizing what these actually mean. But question? Sorry, what page? 443. It's also mentioned. Uh, it's also mentioned on the on the top there. So you know, yeah. So there, there's there's a reason <laughs> um, to measure these. Mostly. Um, you use these measurements to figure out whether or not you have some type of obstructive lung illness. Okay, so this is used functionally in medicine all the time. You can measure people's lung capacities and then determine whether or not that amount of lung capacity is functional for that person. It may be maladaptive if it's like if it's too small. And there are different uh, parts to your lung capacity. So for example, when you're breathing in right now at rest, I'm assuming you're at rest, um, there's a certain volume that's going in and out, right? That's, that's what you see right in the middle here, this, uh, the, the TV in the middle here. That's your tidal volume. So it's the amount of volume that you regularly breathe at rest. Okay? And you can determine some things with tidal volume. Um, but that, I mean, that, that's related to your um, oxygen consumption at rest. Okay? And then you can also measure uh, your VC, which is your vital capacity. That would be your capacity of breath if you inhale all the way as deep as you can inhale, and then you... Push out as much air as you can possibly push out. So the volume from the very top to the very bottom is your vital capacity. That's not your total lung capacity, because when you exhale all the way, your lungs don't collapse. You have a little bit of air remaining in your lungs at the end. That's your residual volume. You add those together to get total lung capacity. So I'm just, I'm just going to get you to go over and review these in the textbook, OK? It, this, honestly, this does not take very long. And then there are a couple follow-up questions that go along with this. Um, and actually, some of them, I, I believe, are, are asking about stuff from yesterday as well. So there's also a reading that you do after that. It's page 447 to page 451 and talks, again, a little bit about functional lung stuff, OK? Um, and when you're doing that, there's a great there's a bunch of new vocabulary in there. Great idea to add that to your vocabulary list while you're doing that. Okay, so there's that. There's a couple questions from the text. It's page uh, 451, numbers one to six, and then there's a little exit quiz there. It's on some of the stuff from the reading and vital capacity, and it talks a little bit about the lung capacity stuff. When you're done that, um, we're going to start the circulatory system. There's a uh, there's a great documentary. It's a little bit old, but it's great documentary in terms of visualization. So some of these things are things I just simply can't show you. I can't show you what red blood cells look like as they're going through capillaries. This is one of the only documentaries I've ever been able to find that actually has a video of blood flowing through a capillary under a microscope. You can actually see what the red blood cells look like as they're going single file through a capillary. So there's, there's a lot of really cool visualizations in this documentary, which is why I, I, I use it. Um, so. We're going we're gonna to watch this together. There's no sheet or anything that goes along with it, um, but it just has a bunch of really cool visualizations that illustrate a bunch of stuff that we're going to talk about in the circulatory system. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just looking for Tara Sharp. Oh, that's not. Okay. Come on over here. Hi. 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 H
you guys have the entire block to work on your projects. Okay, if you have extra time today, you're welcome to work on your project as well. I mean, whenever you have some time, and that that's going to take us right to the break. So then, then you guys are off for two weeks, and we'll chat when you get back. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it to you guys for right now. So this is like I said, there's a, there's a reading in the textbook that goes along with the long capacity sheet that's in your notes. Uh, then there's a follow-up reading here on some functional stuff about the respiratory system and some questions for the text. And then when you're done, there's this cool little documentary. Uh, I highly recommend this one. A lot of great visualizations in there. Feel free to ask questions uh, if you need anything. Okay, here we go. People at home, if you wouldn't mind letting me know that you're here in the chat. My glasses are still foggy. <laughs> Can't see anything. Thanks. So what we're going to do right now, guys, is uh, go through the anatomy of the circulatory system and then just you know, talk a little bit about how it works. Uh, it, the, this, this actually is part of a Google Slides presentation. The Google Slides presentation is actually, uh, it's posted, so if you want to look at it on your own screen, let's, you can do that as well. Um, just give me two seconds, I'm going to finish with attendance here. Um, but we're, we're going to go through that together. Uh, right after that, we're going to talk about the parts of the heart, and then I'm going to dissect a heart so we can take a look inside one. This is a pig heart. It is, this, this is probably not from a full size pig. Um, it's not quite full size, so it's a tiny, tiny bit smaller than a human heart. Um, maybe like 10% or 15% smaller than a human heart, but it's, it's pretty close. I mean, honestly, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference if you held them right beside each other. Um, but the, the cool thing about pigs is that the heart anatomy is identical. There is like no difference whatsoever between the anatomy of the two. So it's like looking at a human heart, which is kind of cool. So I'll bring it around. We can look at the different parts together. This one, I'm not able to get fresh hearts right now. They won't, um, they don't allow people into the, into the, I used to get them from a slaughterhouse. Um, and it's nice if you can get them fresh because it's nice and red. Like it looks like a heart fresh out of a person. This one's been sitting in preservative for a while. So it, it kind of discolors everything and makes it look yellow and weird. So Yes, and, that, and that, things don't look exactly right in it, color-wise, which it makes it harder to identify structures and stuff, and it does look a little bit different. But, I mean, the parts are still there. It just doesn't, it's not quite as clear. So, uh, anyway, we'll do that afterwards and uh, take a closer look. I'll bring it around for the people in the room. If you, if you, want, if you want, if you want a closer look, so people don't want to look too closely at it. <laughs> I understand that, too. Okay. And obviously, it's the same people in the room. Okay, all right. I'm just going to submit my attendance real quick and then we'll get started here.
come on. Why does it always do that? It switches networks on me. Okay, so we've talked about, um, really, all this, um, the systems here come down to respiration, the, the process of cellular respiration. So the digestive system is all about getting the metabolites in, getting the sugar, the fat, uh, protein in an emergency into the system for metabolism. The respiratory system is all about getting the other component of respiration, oxygen, into the system and the waste gases out. Uh, and this is sort of the last component of that, which is what's the in-between? <laughs> so you get it in uh, and you get it out and you get the like materials in and out, but you got to move them around. So the circulatory system is the thing in the middle that is allowing this system to work. It's connecting all the different things together. Now, it's not only there for metabolism, uh, as you'll see as we go through the circulatory system. It's, it's key to transporting all kinds of things, immune cells, uh, hormones for communication, like a whole bunch. We'll, we'll go through it. But so there are a bunch of different functions for it, but it is that key connection um, in, in for respiration in terms of moving materials about in the body. So circulatory systems have three components in general. They have a liquid. So the, by the way, this goes on the note, in case you're wondering. Uh, there has to be some liquid for transportation of stuff. Uh, humans have blood. Uh, mammals have blood. Uh, a number of animals that have circulatory systems have similar fluids. They're not always blood. Um, insects have something called pseudolymph, which is a blood-like fluid, I guess. It doesn't have hemoglobin in it, but um, it's similar uh, in terms of for transporting things around. Um, not every animal has a circulatory system. So... Uh, sea sponges would be an example. Uh, they don't have any type of circulation. So not everything has a circulation system, but the ones that do have some kind of fluid that you got to circulate around in there. You usually have to have vessels. So this is more specific to mammals. Um, mammals and AVs and, uh, need blood vessels to transport the fluid around. You don't have to have vessels. So you could have a chamber. The in insects go for a, more of a chamber system where they're kind of fanning a fluid around inside of a, cha a big chamber where you keep all your organs. And that works because they're very small. Um, but you, you do need like an area. So I, I wrote vessels on here. All mammals require vessels. And you got to have a pump. So you got to have something to actually circulate that fluid around. Mammals all have a true heart. So do avies, uh, reptiles, uh, most, most animals do. Um, that have a circulatory system, but they don't all have a closed chambered heart the way mammals do. Um, some of them have three chambered hearts like reptiles. Um, birds have a four chambered heart, I'm pretty sure. Um, so the, the configurations are slightly different, but they all have some kind of pumping mechanism to move stuff around. Insects have an, uh, like a little fan kind of a thing. So what are you doing with this system? Uh, you got to move food around, so we mentioned that. That's the part of the metabolites, sugar, fat, uh, amino acids for other parts of your metabolism, proteins and synthesis. Uh, you got to move O2 and CO2 around, so O2 to your cells and CO2 away from them. Uh, you got to move waste. So other than your regular energy metabolism, there's lots of other products that your cells produce. When they're breaking down old proteins, they're producing urea and uric acid. Uh, there's ammonia, which is a breakdown product, also from protein. Um, and so as you're turning over these um, various metabolites, there are waste products that are produced, and you've got to get rid of them. So you've got to move it to your kidneys, which is a filter, and then you've got to filter them out and so that your blood takes care of that system. It's hugely important in temperature regulation. So you may have noticed that when you get really hot, you sweat. Where does the water come from in your sweat? It's your blood. <laughs> That's the same water. So you have to transport that to your sweat glands, and then the water is extracted from your blood. So you're sweating out blood, not the red blood cell component, but the liquid component. 
So it is continuous with your blood. Um, and when you're cold, you redirect that liquid away from the surface of your body. You keep it in your core, and that helps to maintain your body temperature. So both the thermoregulation is, uh, this, the circulatory system plays a big role in thermoregulation. Uh, it allows you to heal. So if you poke a hole somewhere in your body, uh, because you have this circulatory system running all over the place, uh, it, uh, it provides you with the opportunity to heal that. So you can transport materials for building new cells. You can seal up the gaps. We're going to talk about clotting mechanisms and how that works in a little bit. Um, so that's part of it. It's, uh, it can be used to transport white blood cells, which is part of your immune system. So it kills bacteria, destroys viruses. Um, it's not necessarily uh, the primary mechanism that you transport white blood cells. So your lymphatic system does a lot of the white blood cell transport. That's like a, another circulatory system that's adjacent to your regular circulatory system, and it doesn't have a pump. So your lymphatic system is more of a passive transport system that kind of exists in parallel. You guys have probably heard of lymph nodes before, like your, uh, like your tonsils and stuff like that. Those are, those are part of your lymphatic system. So there is a sort of parallel circulatory system at play here with no pump. Uh, and a lot of white blood cell stuff is the matter is, is pumped through there, like it moves through there. Um, but a, a number of uh, immune cells are transported in the blood as well. And then lastly, I mentioned this idea of hormones and cytokines. These are cell signaling molecules. So if you want to send a signal from the brain to your kidneys, uh, and it's not a nerve signal, so you can send an instant signal with a nerve. Some of these things are not connected by nerve. Um, then you can do that via hormone signals. You can release a chemical messenger, and then another organ will pick up that chemical messenger. Hormones are usually primarily used for long-term signaling um, nerve impulses are usually used for fast, short-term signaling. They're more energy intensive, so if you need a very fast signal to occur, I've touched something hot, remove your finger before it burns off, <laughs> that's going to be a nerve signal. But if you, most of the other signals associated with hormones are things like, we would like you to increase your growth rate for the next 15 years, like during puberty. Well, you've got to re slowly release some hormones that are going to activate that change in your cells over an extended time period. There are some rapid um, hor a hormone um, signaling mechanisms like adrenaline. So you guys have probably heard that before. You get like a rush of adrenaline and that, that does create a very rapid response from the body, but it's not as quick as a nerve response. So nerve response is, I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, instantaneous. It takes about 15, 25 milliseconds for a nerve uh, signal to distribute uh, from the brain even to like the furthest extremity. That's very fast, right? Um, fractions of a second. Hormone signals take longer than that. So, so if you need it fast, it's got to be a nerve. Anyway, those, those are, there's a lot. There's a lot. We're going to talk about how it does some of those things today. You're, you probably already got an idea for this based on what we've talked about, but there are two circuits that are coming from the pump, from the heart. There's one circuit that is just for that lung um, oxygenation and to drop off carbon dioxide circuit. That's called the pulmonary circuit. So the pulmonary circuit is from one side of your heart just to the lungs and back. Um, and so that way you can isolate the blood that you are trying to add oxygen to from the rest of the blood in the body to increase efficiency. If you were just mixing all this blood together all the time, it makes the process really inefficient. So here you're just sending the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And then once it comes back to the heart and it's all been oxygenated, the other side of the heart is completely dedicated to just pumping blood to the rest of your body. So then that's called the systemic circuit. And it, I mean, it's hugely oversimplified here. It's not one big vessel that goes to your body, but it's, it's split off, right? Some go to the kidneys, the liver, some go to your digestive system, some goes to the skin, etc. right? Muscles. It's, it's going to be subdivided on that side. Go all the different body cells. That's where they drop off their oxygen and nutrients and then they're going to head back to the heart for another cycle. Okay, so two, two main circuits at play here. I should probably have a copy of this note in front of me so I know. If, if I'm going too quickly, let me know, okay? All right, so let's talk about some of these blood components. That's what they look like. Um, and by the way, these are not to scale. <laughs> this picture, it's a terrible scale, actually, because the red blood cells are probably a hundredth of the size of a white blood cell. And the white blood cells are maybe one out of every thousand red blood cells or one out of every 500 red blood cells. So there's, there's not that many of them, anyway, unless you're sick, unless you're ill. 
so okay, we're going to go through these four components, talk about the you know, relative quantities of these and what they do. So you got your plasma, your white blood cells, otherwise known as leukocytes. I'm going to call them leukocytes all the time, um, sort of from this point forward. So just to be clear here, white blood cells are called leukocytes. You've heard that probably in reference to things like leukemia or something like that. Leukemia is a cancer of the white blood cells. Um, so when things are related to white blood cells, they're leuco, leuco related. Um, and platelets, that's used for your clotting mechanisms. And then the last component here, the little tiny red blood cells are called erythrocytes. Okay, so what's the breakdown here in terms of quantity? Uh, the plasma makes up about half. By the way, this breakdown is true for people of moderate physical activity. Okay, it does change depending on how active you are. So we, we previously mentioned that when you exercise all the time, one of the adaptations that you get is you actually make more red blood cells. So it, it decreases the amount of plasma in this breakdown and increases the amount of red blood cells. You could have 70% red blood cells in your blood if you're, if you're a very fit individual. You have more red blood cells as, as a percentage to the whole. So this is sort of for someone of average fitness. Uh, you, all, you can also, by the way, have less. So, uh, I mean, if you're hugely sedentary, uh, you have very little physical activity, it goes below this quantity and you get more plasma in your blood than this. Um, so, anyway, it makes up about half, though. There's a little section in the middle there when you spin it down in a, in a centrifuge. It's a white coating uh, in the middle that contains your white blood cells and a very, very, very small percentage of that is platelets. Platelets actually, by volume, make up a very, very small uh, percentage of your blood. If you were to like smear some blood onto a, a slide um, and there was maybe you know 10,000 red blood cells on there or maybe 50,000 you would be hard pressed to find more than a few platelets. So they're, they're not just like a, a huge amount of them floating around your blood. They're in there um, but there are relatively if you compare like the numbers to the other types of blood cells very few. And uh, the erythrocytes the, the red blood cells make up the rest. A little less than half uh, again, depending on fitness level. So what's in the plasma? Uh, most of it's water. So I mentioned that like you sweat it out. Um, when you're sweating out, it's water, mostly. Um, there is a little bit of uh, blood protein in there. That includes things like cytokines. Those are cell signaling proteins. Um, albumin, globulins, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is used for clotting. Uh, and some regulatory proteins. These, again, these are cell signaling molecules. So that makes up a little bit of the plasma, but not a huge percentage. Uh, it's about 7% by weight, so not a lot. Uh, and then there are a couple other small things that are actually very important that are in your blood. So it makes up less than 1% of the mass of the, of the plasma, but the electrolyte component, that's the salt component, sodium chloride usually. There's also some sodium... Um, Uh, potassium uh, chloride in there, potassium chloride and sodium chloride, um, makes up a very small percentage by weight and, and volume of your blood, but it's very important. You can't have, uh, if the salt concentration gets too low, I mean, you can die. So it's surprisingly important considering how little there is in there. Uh, and then that's also that 1% by weight is where you transport things like sugar dissolved into your blood. Uh, and dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide. Those are the respiratory gas components. They don't make up a lot of volume or mass, but again, they're really important. Um, and some waste products are dissolved. So it's interesting to note that when you look at this, this should be fairly easy in order to manufacture, right? Make some fake plasma for a human, which you use in hospitals to replenish when people lose blood. Uh, the water part's easy, <laughs> so that's easy to come by. Most of the solute stuff is fairly easy. You can dissolve some salt in the water. You can dissolve some, so, uh, uh, some potassium chloride in the water. Um, the respiratory gases, you don't have to include that part. Your body is happy to add those. Uh, and then the waste products part, you can actually eliminate. So if you're making fake plasma, you don't have to put waste in there. Um, and so this part's easy. This part's hard. So you can get albumin, which is a protein. Uh, you can steal it from cattle. So they can take it from blood from cattle albumin. It's the same as human albumin. So there, you can use that. But a bunch of this other stuff, regulatory proteins and the globulins and things like that are human specific. And so they're very difficult to manufacture and make fake versions of. So we, there, we do have fake plasma, but it's not as good. So there, there is a, you guys have, maybe you've seen this, like 
oftentimes it's just like a saline solution that they'll give people if they don't have regular plasma available and you need plasma. But for the most part, we need blood donation. So uh, certainly on the plasma end, it's a little bit easier to make a fake version of this. On the other end, if you need to give people red blood cells, let's say they've lost a lot of blood, liters and liters of blood, at this point, we've, we've got to give you blood from someone else. We, we, we don't really have a way to give you an alternative for red blood cells. Not that we figured out anyway, and we don't have any way of producing them yet. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the plasma component. The erythrocytes, um, little tiny inner tube-like structures, they're enucleated, they don't have nuclei. Uh, and then they, they are the primary transporters of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And the last component here would be, uh, well, the platelets makes up a very small proportion. They're sort of pseudo cells, they also don't have nuclei. And the white blood cells are much larger than the red blood cells, but again, you don't typically have that many um, being transported in your blood unless you're ill. So your white blood cell count is usually pretty low unless you're sick. And they're responsible for all kinds of stuff. They can eat things, uh, eat bacteria, they can, per they can create antibodies uh, which help tag the bad guys, uh, all kinds of different functions. Uh, maybe I'll post a video later on immune system function and how the white blood cells operate, but it's a pretty complicated cascade of how they work together. There's several different types, uh, and they work together to destroy invaders. We might take a day uh, when you come back to talk about how vaccines work uh, and a little bit about mRNA vaccines, which would be really interesting. That's the what the COVID vaccine is that they're currently distributing in Canada. Uh, it's based on sort of a new technique, well, 15 years old, which is fairly new for vaccinations, uh, in, in terms of like designing and... Uh, designing a new vaccine. Maybe you guys are interested. I don't know if people care about that. It's a really interesting process about how it works. Um, it's, it's much easier to very rapidly create a new vaccine using mRNA technology than previous, so, which is why a uh, vaccine exists already. Uh, anyway, uh, is this, this is like a separate part of your, uh, of the note. I can't remember. Is there like a spot for this? Yeah. Okay. So again, this makes up about half of your blood volume. It's water protein, a little bit of protein, and some dissolved stuff in there. We can make a moderately good fake version of this. So good, you guys have that. You guys are fast. Okay, cool. Red blood cells, as I already mentioned, are called erythrocytes. You make these in your bone marrow. Uh, as part of the process for manufacturing them, the nucleus is removed at maturity. They don't really require a nucleus, so they're not doing a lot of protein synthesis. Well, they're doing none as mature cells. They're just kind of floating around, binding to oxygen, and releasing it, and binding and releasing it. So they have a very simple metabolism, uh, and they don't really require very much. If you actually look inside the red blood cell, they're tiny, first of all, much smaller than an average human cell. And there's just not much cellular machinery inside. So they... They don't really do that much, but they do bind to oxygen, which is very useful. Uh, and that shape is called a biconcave disc. It kind of looks like an inner tube. Um, and yeah, right, its primary um, function is for gas transportation. So if you look into the center of a red blood cell, you will see a complex in there, a hemoglobin complex. Um, uh, at the center of each of the four complexes, so there's it's a four complex or four subunit complex, at the center of each subunit is something called a heme group, and the heme group has an iron uh, atom at the center of it. That's why you need to consume iron as part of your diet. It is exclusively used in metabolism for this purpose. Uh, and iron, as you probably are already aware, likes to bind to oxygen. If you leave some iron out, just sitting out, it binds to oxygen readily and rusts. Uh, and this is basically a controlled rust is what it is. <laughs> so you have this in the center of your uh, heme groups and it likes to stick to oxygen, just like it does, iron does out in nature. Uh, and, but the nice thing about this system is it can selectively attach and detach from oxygen as opposed to um, metallic iron more permanently binds with oxygen. In this case, it forms sort of like a tentative bond to oxygen that depending on the concentration of oxygen, it will release if the concentration of oxygen goes below a certain quantity. It actually 
disfavors the bonding of oxygen and so it will drop it off. So it, it makes a nice little transporter for oxygen. Uh, and so then therefore each hemoglobin carries four oxygen atoms because you have those four subunits. Each, each will bind to one. Um, and when it does bind, it slightly changes the conformation of the heme group. Uh, and then it, so the color looks different. It reflects a different part of the color spectrum. Uh, just really quickly, I can show you um, with the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. There we go. So this is hugely exaggerated. <laughs> People are under the, impression, uh, under the impression that deoxygenated blood is purple or some kind of blue color. <laughs> it's really not, okay? Uh, now, there is a color difference, but I would say that it's relatively minor. So uh, it, it, I guess it does have more of sort of a purplish tinge to it when it's deoxygenated, but I mean, realistically, it's not that um, significant. So the reason why the blood in your veins looks blue is not so much because of the, the different color of the blood, although the blood is slightly darker. So that is part of it. But the other part of it is the blood vessel and the other tissues that are sitting on top they absorb the other parts of the color spectrum, especially the blood vessel itself. So um, it's absorbing the red part and the green part of the spectrum. And so the blue part is more obvious, uh, more obviously being reflected. So the blood itself is not blue, um, but if you add all of the different materials together in the vein, they do reflect the other parts of this, or they do absorb the other parts of the spectrum and reflect blue. So it does look blue from the outside. I promise if you were to cut this out, <laughs> don't do it, but I promise if you did, um, it, would, it would be red in there. It is red, uh, just a little bit darker. And it is true that once it's oxygenated, it's bright red. So it does, it does change uh, in tone. Okay, white blood cells. Those are the leukocytes. Um, they're there to detect proteins. We, we've talked about this previously, the idea of the little flags, the, the antigen detection. I think, I think we mentioned this in the first unit. Um, but just in brief again, um, there are shapes on the, like if you've got a little bacteria, there are like little shapes that stick out on the side of the bacteria. And these white blood cells are capable of detecting the shape. Some of them will straight up eat the shape when they see it. Uh, depending on the type of antigen shape on the bacteria or virus particle. Um, some of them require a little bit more help to find it, and that's what the antibodies are for. Um, and so there are separate white blood cells. They're quite a bit bigger than bacteria usually. And they, their only job is to produce these little flags, and the flags specifically stick to those antigens of the particular invader, uh, and, and they will tell other white blood cells, eat this thing. The flags also have the added bonus of usually deactivating that antigen. So if it's a functional antigen, like it uses that antigen to signal with other bacteria or it uses that antigen for, as part of to eat or whatever, uh, it also has the added bonus of inactivating the antigen on the bacteria, so preventing it from functioning properly. So antibodies are great. Uh, in short, this is the purpose of a vaccine. So you're training your body to recognize the shapes, the antigens, uh, and there are various ways to do that. Maybe we'll talk more about specifically of mRNA vaccines after the break, but they're a really effective way of building a detection system for something. So if you're curious to see how the COVID vaccine works, we can look at that one specifically. Um, white blood cells are also cool because the macrophage component, uh, and actually some of the T cells and B cells as well, have the ability to navigate the inside of your body. They can physically crawl over the insides of your vessels and once they leave the vessels, they can crawl through the tissue to go to a specific location, which is, which is really cool. Like they kind of like squeeze through autonomously uh, and find an infection. So if you have an infected area, wherever it happens to be, like you have a cut or something that gets infected, the bacteria in that infected location are producing cytokines. They're cell signaling molecules. Um, or your immune system has some cells that were in the area that found the bacteria and they produced some cell signaling molecules, some cytokines, and that causes inflammation. So inflammation is where blood rushes to the area, gets red and swollen, 
Uh, and that's to allow the easier navigation of white blood cells. It's so white blood cells can get to that area easier um, so that they, 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 they go through that fluid as part of the um, inflammation. Uh, and they squeeze out of the red blood, out of the, um, out of the capillaries and stuff. They'll find a little holes in the capillary, force their way through, and they congregate in the area of the infection. They're drawn by those chemical messengers to the area so that they can eat or destroy that potential invader there. It's a really cool process. You don't really think of them as being like these autonomous, they're kind of like little, you know, robots. They're like moving around on the inside looking for an invader to eat it, uh, listening to the cell signals of their cohort. It's pretty cool. Um, the enzyme component, yeah, they, so they do other things too. They also produce some enzymes that deactivate uh, some of the cytokines that are produced by bacteria and stuff to varying amounts of uh, effect depending on the type of bacteria. So if you've got a botulism infection or something like that, uh, they don't really have the ability to produce anything um, that inactivates botulinum toxin, which is why botulism can be so dangerous for humans. But other types of bacterial infections, staph infections, things that are very common, um, your white blood cells are actually very good at deactivating a lot of the proteins that are manufactured by the bacteria. So, um, And they also produce antibodies, as we mentioned, so those are the little flags. So that's the white blood cell component. They're eating things. They're, it's a pretty complex system. And then the platelets... Um, they're small cells slash cell fragments. Uh, they don't have, like, again, all the cellular machinery. These are smaller yet even than red blood cells. You can see them. They're slightly smaller than red blood cells. They also don't have nuclei. Um, and, and their job is to promote clotting of blood, getting blood to stick together into clumps, uh, to block holes. So, uh, and they, they're very good at that. These guys, similar to red blood cells, don't live very long, um, usually around 10 days. Red blood cells live a little bit longer, 60 days, uh, but, but not super long. For uh, A lot of cells in the body uh, have a longer lifespan than that. So in basic, the clotting mechanism, what's happening? So let's say you poke a hole in the system, which, by the way, you are doing all the time. Even when you just like casually bump your arm against something, you do actually create small tears in your capillary network. Uh, I mean, not if you're just casually, gently touching something, but anytime you bump something, uh, you are breaking apart, you know, little areas of, of your capillaries. Uh, if you have a blood clotting disorder, like a very severe blood clotting disorder, you get bruising from that stuff, you know? You, you bump into a, a door gently, like not even that hard, and you get bruising, basically from casual contact. Everybody makes those small tears, but you're, in general, your platelets are very good at quickly repairing those holes, and so nothing comes of any of those things, unless you get a really big break, a severe hit. Um, so what's happening when you break it is a bunch of cell signaling molecules are released by these broken cells. So you have cells that are actually getting damaged, right? And they're releasing a signal saying, there's a hole here. I've broken. Okay, I've ruptured. Uh, and the platelets uh, can read that signal, okay, and they aggregate, and they stimulate a hormone uh, production called thrombin. Uh, and then thrombin, thrombin is sort of a second, secondary um, signaling mechanism. There are proteins called fibrinogen that are just transporting through your blood. Okay, it's sort of like, if I could describe, what is fibrinogen like? It's sort of like wisps of spider web, kind of, except not sticky. So fibrinogen is a non-sticky wisp of spider web that's sort of, it's a protein that's just kind of just casually making its way through your blood. But when it comes into contact with thrombin, when they touch each other, it changes the shape of the fibrinogen and makes it sticky. It turns it into a, a different configuration of that protein called fibrin. Fibrin sticks to platelets. So the platelets have aggregated at the location wherever the cut is, and now you have this fibrin that's coming by, and as it hits it, it sticks to it and starts to form a mesh. So this is an adaptive response. You want this to happen. It quickly patches over tiny holes in the blood vessels. And if they're small, tiny holes, they repair extremely quickly. You know, a 24-hour period, you've already repaired all that damage easily. Uh, now, if obviously, if it's more significant, the damage, it takes longer. You've got to build more cells to fill in the gaps. And uh, it depends on how big the hole is. So, and, and also the vessel. So capillaries are very low pressure. We're going to talk about that in a second. So if you, if you break some capillaries, this, this mechanism can happen in seconds. OK, 
Okay, you can have a cut, and then it can be completely clotted in seconds. It's very, very fast. Uh, if it's in a uh, vein, which you've, you've probably given some type of blood sample before, you've had a puncture to a vein, uh, you may have noticed it really takes 10 seconds to seal a small puncture in your vein. You just have to put a little bit of pressure on it. And again, this, this is very fast. Okay, it seals the, the hole. If it's a very large puncture in a vein, like a cut in a vein, uh, it takes longer as long as they're applying pressure. But it's e fairly easily uh, you can plug that hole. Arteries are a little different. So they're deeper, but we'll talk about where they run in a second, and they're under extremely high pressure. So when you poke a hole in an artery, which you likely have never done before, uh, there's a lot of, it's like three PSI in an artery. So there's just quite a bit of pressure pushing the blood out. And so you got to apply significant pressure to kind of kickstart this process. You have to slow the flow to allow this to occur. If you've got a really big arterial injury, like a severed artery, <laughs> you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. So uh, in general, you have to for either repair it surgically or, or you may have to actually block the flow of the artery. You can use a tourniquet. Um, that will block the flow through the artery until you can have it repaired. Uh, but ar arterial bleeds are a lot more difficult to control because they're under high pressure. So this, this system does not work great for arterial bleeds, but for everything else, it's quite effective. Anyway, that, that's in general how it works. There's more cell signaling happening there than what I'm mentioning, but that's, that's the basic process. It's uh, fairly straightforward. There are sort of two ways that this can go wrong. You can have too much signaling occur. Okay, so that's inappropriate signaling in which case you may have clots that are just forming in your blood. That's bad, okay? Obviously, those clots can block important blood vessels. It can cause a heart attack or a stroke. And so there are people that are in sort of like a prothrombic state. They are very likely to form clots, and you may have to take medication for that if that's the case. There's also the opposite of that. So having a low platelet count or having some other problem with the signaling mechanism may mean that you don't form clots when you need to, and then you just bleed a lot. Uh, we, did we talk about hemophilia back in the genetics unit? I can't remember if we did. Did that come up? Anyway, hemophilia is a genetic disorder um, where you don't form clots really, really at all. I mean, not very well, anyway. Uh, and so you can have a small bleed, like cut yourself shaving, and you can bleed for 24 hours. Like, you can have, like, a very serious bleed from that. Um, and so that's also a serious condition probably requires medication, depending on how serious it is for you. This is what it looks like under an electron microscope. So when you look at it, uh, these are red blood cells flowing in your blood. The slightly denser areas right here are actually uh, platelets. Platelet, platelet, platelet cell. And then you can see the wisps of fibrin here that are attached to it. They've just sort of come along and stuck to it as they flow by. And they form this really cool little web that prevents red blood cells from escaping through the hole. I know I mentioned this previously. Uh, this, is a, this is an actual head. <laughs> it's a person's head. Uh, have, you, have you guys ever heard of body worlds before? Have I mentioned this? No. Let me show you real quickly what it looks like. So body worlds is like a traveling um, exhibit. It's made from human bodies. It was at the Science Center for a, lo uh, for a while. Uh, I went there when I was in university. Um, and it, it, it's, I, I guess you could say it's art, <laughs> questionably art, uh, made from human bodies. And what they do um, is they plasticize the tissues. So they use a chemical process to essentially turn your tissues into plastic uh, and so that they become permanently formed in a particular shape. Um, but everything is made out of people it's, it's, or, or animals. There are some animals there as well. I'm fairly certain people are volunteering for this. So this is something that people are donating their body to. Uh, there was a controversy like 20 years ago about them using people that have been executed in China or something to make their art. I have a feeling that they don't do that anymore. But anyway, there was a controversy at one point about that. Uh, so they, um, this, was, this was actually at the exhibit that I went to. Um, so those are, that's the actual vasculature of the human face, which is really cool because they, what they do is they plasticize just the blood vessels and then they use like an acid to remove all the other tissue. So it's only the blood vessels that are left behind. So that's what you're looking at right there. And it's really amazing how many actual blood vessels you have running through your face. A lot. It's, they're extremely dense. That this, is, this is kind of misleading because your face is one of the most highly vascularized places on your body. Very strangely. <laughs> uh, it has a lot, a lot of blood supply. If you've ever watched like UFC and ever seen somebody be cut on the face, 
I mean, it bleeds like crazy, even if you have a small cut. Uh, and that's because of the, hot, the, the sheer amount of vasculature you have in your face. We're not entirely sure why this has evolved in humans. This is not true for all animals, by the way. Uh, and so it may have something to do with early human-to-human um, -human communication. Uh, and the things like blushing and things like that were important in early human communication. And so this was an evolved trait in humans. But we don't, we don't know precisely the reason why there's so much vasculature in the face. It's not completely adaptive. Like, we don't need to have this much vasculature. So I really some modern humans don't. Um, but to some extent, this, this amount of vasculature is found everywhere, to a slightly lesser extent. So it's, it's, it's interesting to think how many blood vessels you actually have in your body. They, they're permeating everything, right? Um, so I, I think that's cool. All right. Did, did I get through the entire thing? Do we cover everything? Sweet. Let's talk about the heart. Let's talk about the pump that actually moves this stuff around. Oh, uh, actually, before we get to that, um, let's talk about the three vessels. Three K. Oh, is that after? Hold on. What's my note here? Uh, I will save this part for tomorrow. Uh, what should I do here? Okay, let's do the heart. Let's do the heart dissection. Let's do this first. This is the next page of your notes, anyway. So what we're going to do right now, uh, we're just going to go through the anatomy of the heart. What's a heart look like? Uh, and then once we're done that, uh, we're going to open it up and have a look at a real one. Okay, so you can see what it looks like. So um, you already know what it is. It's a pump. And it's got a pump fluid through a huge complex network of vessels, hundreds of kilometers of vessels in your body. So there's a lot of vessels there. And so this has got to be a pretty um, high pressure unit in order to actually push um, liquid through. It's, it, it's really interesting when you think about what it's actually doing. So it has to pump constantly for 80 plus years. It's not allowed to stop, otherwise you die. Uh, and it has to maintain a certain pressure um, and essentially have zero failure. Uh, and we don't have any kind of a machine that can reproduce this, not without significant service. So, I mean, it's really kind of a miraculous machine. It, it's, it's never allowed to stop, um, unlike your other muscles, by the way, which are constantly resting in between contraction. So um, this is a, a unique circumstance. The muscle tissue is slightly different uh, because it really cannot fail. So you, no matter what you do, you're, you're not allowed to pause to take a break to let your heart muscle tissue recharge. So it has a slightly different metabolism because of that. 100,000 beats a day. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of beats. And it's pumping at about 3 PSI. So that's, uh, we talked about 110 millimeters of mercury. That's something like 3 PSI. Same pressure that you'd have inside like a football, a properly inflated football. So it's a fair amount of pressure. We mentioned the idea of the two loops. So one loop goes to the lungs, that's the respiratory loop, or the uh, pulmonary loop rather, um, where it's picking up and dropping off gases, and then it goes to your body cells and does the same. So what I'm going to do here, I I've color coded this purple and red. Uh, the purple slash blue here is, are the parts of the heart that are dealing with deoxygenated blood. Okay, don't be confused. The blood's not actually purple, um, but it does help distinguish between the two sides, and most textbooks do this. Um, so I'm going to start here with the blood that is actually returning from the body. Okay, and then we'll work our way around through the whole system. We'll follow it through. I'll do the same thing with the actual heart. So from the lower half of your body, You've got a big vein, the inferior vena cava, that runs through your torso uh, that is going to collect all of the used blood, the deoxygenated blood, from the lower half of your body. Okay, so that's, that blood vessel is called the inferior vena cava. In anatomical terms, inferior means lower okay, or below. So the inferior vena cava is the lower one. Vena means vein, and cava just means cavernous or large. Okay. So this is the lower large vein, just in Latin. They, they weren't getting creative with these names, which is good. You don't want creative. You have one of those coming from the top half of your body as well, 
collecting all of the deoxygenated blood from your head and your arms and stuff. Uh, and then that is the superior, in anatomical words, uh, terminology superior means above or upper. So we have upper cavernous vein, or big vein. And it really is cavernous. You can put your whole index finger in there. It's a big old vein. If you ever get to do a human dissection, put it in there. It's cool. So both of those converge on the right side of the heart. Now, before we get to this, I just want to mention, this always confuses people, that this side of the heart over here, the deoxygenated side, uh, is the right side of the heart because this is the view facing someone. Okay? So this is their right-hand side. They're facing you, right? This is, so it would be on your body's right over here. Okay? This is so confusing because it's on the left side of the diagram. So it's like, okay, well, it's a right ventricle, right atrium, but it's on the left side of the diagram. But it's on the right side of the person. Okay? So this is important because the person is facing you. Okay? They're looking at you. So you're looking at your left, but it's their right. Okay? For some reason, this really trips people up. So this always gets flipped on people's diagrams when they do this on a test. So don't, don't flip it in your mind. Okay? The, the person is facing you. So the right atrium is the top part here of their heart. The right atrium is a chamber. It's one of the four chambers of the heart. Uh, and its role is to pump blood. So it's this up here, this chamber right here. And its job is only to fill the chamber below it. Okay? It doesn't really do very much. These models are all terrible because they make the atrium look like it's as big as the ventricle. But I'll show you when you see the actual heart. This is teeny tiny, okay? It's very thin. It looks like a little flap, basically, on top of the right side of the heart. It doesn't look like this big bulky piece on top that is the same size as the ventricle. Okay, that's hugely misleading. Uh, the very first time I dissected a heart, uh, I did a human dissection, and I couldn't find it <laughs> because I was like, where is this big structure that's supposed to be on top of the ventricle? Yeah, it doesn't look like this in real life. I'll show you what it looks like, but it's very misleading. It's, it's, it's a small little flappy structure that's on top over here. So anyway, it goes into this chamber, and this pumps the blood when it contracts down below here into the right ventricle. Okay, so the right ventricle is the bigger chamber underneath. There is a valve in between those two chambers. Let's see if I can highlight it on here. Oops. Right here. Can you guys see that highlight? Is that showing up? Kind of, sort of? Yeah, the yellow. Yeah. It's faint. Okay, let me see if I can find a better color. Maybe green? No, that's not good either. Darker green? Lighter green. That's yellow. I already used pink. Uh, okay, what about what about blue? Okay, there we go. That's a little bit better. Okay, there's a valve in between. So the reason you need a valve is because both of these are pumping, right? And you don't want you want to make sure that the blood is always going in one direction. If this chamber, the atrium up here, pumps down, and then this one down here pumps up. Uh, it's just going to send the blood right back into it again, right? They're just going to pump the blood in between the two chambers. So you don't want the blood going backwards. So this valve in between pre prevents backflow. That's what all the valves do. Okay, you want to keep the, the blood moving in one direction through the heart. They have these really cool cords. You can, you can kind of see them in the model here. They look like strings on the model. These are actually attached on both ends. I'll show you in the real heart as well. Uh, they're in orange here on my diagram. Those are called the cordae tendinae. So the cordae tendinae are your heart strings. Have you ever heard of somebody tugging at your heart strings? You do have strings in there. Uh, and they keep the valve from prolapsing, from going backwards. So because there's so much pressure in the ventricle, if you didn't have something holding, physically holding the valve in place, uh, it would just collapse backwards. So it can't, it can't manage that much pressure, 3 PSI. That's quite a bit of pressure. So, um, or Well, it's slightly le less, less on the right side of the heart, but anyway, approximately. Um, so the cordae tendinae, your heart strings, 
uh, just prevent the valves from getting blasted backwards during the pump. So then the right ventricle down here is going to contract. It's this part. And it's going to send blood up through this vessel right here. So there's a second valve as it pumps. That valve is called the tricuspid. The reason why it's called a tricuspid is it has three tricusps. Okay? I, I tried to draw it on here. It's like three separate cusps. Uh, so they come together in a three-way configuration to prevent blood, again, from going backwards. So after the ventricle pumps, blood is going to go up through this valve, and you don't want it to fall back into the ventricle again. So the valve right here after the pump just keeps blood from going backwards. So then it's going to proceed. This is still deoxygenated blood, right the way, by the way. It does not have any oxygen in it. It's going to proceed um, out through these arteries. There's an artery that goes left and an artery that goes right because you've got a lung on both sides. Okay, so those are the two pulmonary arteries, the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. One goes to your left lung, one goes to your right lung. And that's where the gas exchange is going to happen. So it's pumping the blood to the lungs. It's going to get distributed all around your various um, alveoli. And then some gas exchange is going to occur. Oxygen in, CO2 out. After that gas exchange happens, there is another blood vessel at the end of the line, two major veins. So veins are going towards the heart. Always arteries go away from the heart. So there's two veins coming back from the, from the lungs, and those are called the pulmonary veins. And they enter on the other side of the heart. So on this model right here, it would be these two right here, coming back into the little tiny chamber on this side, the left atrium. OK, so your pulmonary veins come in. They go into the left atrium. The left atrium's only job, just like the right atrium, is to fill the ventricle underneath it. So it contracts and pushes blood down in here. It's a little bit difficult to see on this model. It's a little bit more obvious on this picture. This diagram is pretty good, actually. That the left-hand side here is much thicker than the right-hand side. And there's a reason for that. The right-hand side is only pumping blood 10 inches, right? From the heart to the lungs. They're beside each other. So it doesn't really have to pump the blood very far. Now, it does have to pump, pump it through a complex network of capillaries in the lungs. So it does have to have a moderate amount of pressure, but not nearly as much as the left-hand side, because the left-hand side is going to be pumping the blood to the entire body. So it's got to get blood to the top of your head. It's got to get blood to the bottom of your toes, tips of your fingers, all over the place, right? And it's, it's quite a network of blood vessels that you've got. So on the left-hand side, this is where you get the really, really strong pump. Okay, it's much thicker. I'll show you with the heart when I bring it around. But the left-hand side is much thicker than the right-hand side. And it's going to give a big pump, and it's going to send blood out through this valve right here. This other valve right here is called the uh, bicuspid valve. Oh, I think I did, I did I remember to name the other valves between the atrium and the ventricles? I can't remember if I did. The, the, the ones that are between the atrium and the ventricles, so between this chamber, the top chamber, and the bottom, are just simply called AV valves. Atrioventricular valves, atrium ventricle. It's an atrium ventricle valve. Okay, this one on the left and one on the right, and they're just both called AV valves. So those are fairly straightforward. And then it goes, like I said, it goes through this valve over here. This valve is called the bicuspid valve, and the reason for that is it has two cusps instead of three, so it's called a bicuspid. Again, the purpose of that valve is to keep blood from flowing backwards into the heart again once it's been pumped out. You don't want backflow of blood. So it goes up through the bicuspid, and then it goes out into this gargantuan blood vessel on top of the heart. You can see the big ring on here. This is the highest pressure area in your entire circulatory system. It's right after the, re the left ventricle. Uh, this is called your aorta. So this blood vessel is, is there to distribute blood to the various locations in your body. So you can see there's three vessels off the top, right arm, left arm, and head. And then there's also a circling around that happens at the back. And it actually goes, you don't see it on the diagram here, but it continues on below the heart. Okay, so it circles around, it goes down, 
and that is for the entire lower body. Okay, it gets distributed to your organs, to, uh, to your skin, etc. Nervous system, whatever. Everything on the lower half. Did you guys do these parts in grade 10? Yeah. You did? With all the details here, you talked about the valves and stuff? Yeah. 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 You did? Okay, so it really depends on who you had in grade 10. So some people do it, some people don't. Okay, cool. Did you do this heart dissection? No. You do the heart dissection. Sorry. Normally, we would I would give everybody a heart, or at least we do it in groups. But I don't I don't have enough equipment, and, and we can't. Uh, so sterilizing the equipment is a problem. So I'll bring it around. Question. How do the valves work to like block out? I don't remember. Like, have you said they make sure the blood doesn't do backflow? So <laughs> they're kind of like a. A soft tissue version of this. They're this. So what happens is when they receive pressure from this end, the pressure can push the valve open. But when they have pressure from the other end, the pressure actually pushes the valves together the other way. So just because of their physical shape, they allow movement to go this way. But when there's a push from the other end, it pushes the valves closed as the back pressure pushes up against them. So that, that's how the cusps work here. So that, like, this would be like a bicuspid valve that would work like this. A tricuspid is just the same thing with three of those. And they're actually surprisingly effective. Um, I'll, I'll try and show you what the, it's really hard to see what the AV valves look like. There's actually a number of different, <sighs> maybe I can find a video of this actually. Hold on. I bet you I can find like, a, like, a, like an animated GIF or something. Actually, that's pretty good. Here's an MRI scan of a valve. There you go. So have a look at the shape of the valve here. When blood is getting pumped this way, like towards the camera, it just pushes the flap up. But when there's backflow, because of the shape of the valve, it actually forces the valve back down again to cover up the vessel. So it only allows blood to proceed in one direction. Hmm. So those, that's actually that's an AV valve that you're seeing right there from somebody's heart. Cool. MRI is so cool. That's an fMRI, functional one. Really cool. Okay, let's take a look at this actual heart. Let me get set up here. Not a perfect system. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, that's actually surprisingly good. Does a magnifier work? Oh yeah, it does. Sweet. Awesome. All right, let's do this. Oh, I'm gonna get my lab coat. I don't want hard on me. <laughs> this, you know what this is supposed to be? Uh, years ago, there was like a, an organ donor drive happening. It's like be a donor, organ donor, be a whatever, blood donor. Uh, and so my class was like, oh, we'll put some organs on your lab coat. I was like, oh, cool, cool, I'll put some organs on there. <laughs> and then they drew these on. And everyone afterwards was like, what's that? What's that mess on there? <laughs> it's supposed to, I don't know why they're green. Why are they green? green? I, I didn't tell them to use green. I have no idea why they're green. 
Red was available. There were other colors. I, I don't know. <laughs> This is a heart. This is helpful because um, it actually lets us look a little bit at the external anatomy of the heart as well. Hopefully this isn't too stinky. If it's getting stinky, we'll open a window. Okay? It probably doesn't smell great. True, true. It has a little. Okay, so the first thing that I want to mention here, uh, let's take a look at the external anatomy of the heart. So I'm going to orient it exactly the same as it would be um, in, in the diagram. Okay, so it looks like this, all right? So over here, we've got the right ventricle. This is the right ventricle right here. It's actually um, handily more or less, well, actually it probably runs like this, but it's sort of separated here by this um, artery on the outside. This is a coronary artery. So the external arteries of the heart, like this coronary artery that's running right here, and there's also another one that runs around the back of the heart right here. That's a circumflex coronary artery. So the purpose of those arteries is to provide blood to the heart tissue. So while the heart muscle is pumping blood through it, it doesn't actually get oxygen from that blood that's going through the heart. It needs its own blood supply. So its own blood supply comes from these coronary arteries, which are on the outside. Those are the arteries that get blocked if you're having a heart attack. Okay, So it's not the blood going through the heart that gets blocked. It's the blood going into like the heart muscle tissue itself that gets blocked. So it's one of these coronary arteries. Um, so this is the right ventricle. Oh, let me actually, hold on. Let me orient this again properly. Uh, actually, I had, it, I had it backwards. Silly me. There we go. Right ventricle. Here it is. And then you'll notice that the left ventricle is pretty big, right? It's bigger than the right ventricle. It's thicker. I'll show you once, but when I, once I cut it in half. It's quite a bit thicker. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice here is that the atriums are teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, this is all hardened because it was, uh, ugh. It's all hardened from the preservative. But this little thing that I'm gripping at the top here, this pinkish fold, that's the atrium. So it's, 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 it's not nearly as big as they make it look in that diagram, guys. It's like a tiny little, I remember looking at this in, in the lab and being like, what the heck is that? That's it. That's the atrium on top. So there's really not that much to it. Its only job, remember, is just to pump blood just into the ventricle down here. So it doesn't need to be that bulky. And it's certainly not high pressure, because it's just like a little flap that pushes blood down into the ventricle. And then this is the left atrium on this side. I don't know if I get my finger in it. It's quite tough. It's like beef jerky. The fresh hearts are totally different, by the way. They're all like supple and soft, just like a real heart would be. Once they go in the preservative, it kind of does a number on it. OK, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to make a sagittal cut cut it like this. Uh, so hopefully it looks exactly like the diagram at the end. That's the idea. Okay, so then we'll try and uh, parse out all of these structures that we've just been discussing. I'll try not to cut myself with this. All right. Got right ventricle, left ventricle. Uh, okay, here we go. Be a Thanks. <laughs> At one point, I did surgery on lab animals. I had a license to do minor surgery on lab animals because I had to put in probes and things like that and remove tissue samples from lab animals. It's kind of fun. That was one of like my record school fights. But with lab animals, they die accidentally, then it's not a huge deal. Uh, if you're a vet, it's more of a big deal. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't I don't require an electro soldery tool or anything here because there's no blood flow through this thing. It is very similar to cutting a cutting some beef jerky. The fresh one again, very different. <laughs> I try not to damage the structures inside. <laughs> oh, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. 
And it's meaty, yeah. All right, so this right here is the view that you would have got um, in your diagram, okay? So uh, this up here, uh, it's a little bit damaged, but this up here would be the atrium. Can you see that? And then in between is the valve. So this is the, this like white tissue right here. Can I get that in focus? Is the, oh yeah, there we go. So you can see the valve. This is the valve. Right below it, these strings that are attached right here, these are the, the heart strings, the chordae tendineae, that keep the valve from prolapsing. And then down here, this is the ventricle. Keep in mind that the preservative has kind of shrunk this heart up a little bit. So the ventricles are, they're bigger than this. This is, this is like a, like I said, like a beef jerky version of this. So it's like, it's, it's shrunken a little bit. So I, it's about twice as big as this normally. So there, there's a, it's shrunk up quite a bit, but there's, there's a fairly large chamber. But one of the things I want you to note here is if you look at the amount of muscle fiber here, and then you look at the amount of muscle fiber on the left-hand side, you'll notice that the left-hand side is way bigger, right? Again, this side is for pumping to the body, and this side is for pumping to the lungs. So you need less muscle tissue to pump to the, to the lungs. Okay, so then this thing is gonna pump blood up and out, and of course, I cut off the part that you wanna see by accident. <laughs> okay, it would go up through here. So I'll push my finger through. There it goes, through this vessel right here. This is the pulmonary artery, so this is gonna to go to the lungs. Okay, and then, then it goes out through the lungs, gets oxygenated, and it comes back in on this side. Uh, of course, the vessels got cut off in the removal process, but right there would be where the two pulmonary veins come back into the heart, okay? So this is the left atrium on this side. Again, really doesn't look like much. That's it. It's just like a little sack on top. Um, it's, a, like, it's a little shrunken, for sure, due to that whatever's happened to this heart. But, um, and as you can see on this side as well, right here. And then actually, here, uh, I'm gonna actually poke my finger through from the atrium to the ventricle. What's going on here? Oh, I see. It's supposed to be sitting like this. So from the atrium, here's my finger inside the ventricle right there. And then that would be coming down in here. Pull my finger back out so you can see it again. Like that. Keep in mind that this is reversed because I'm, I'm holding it upside down. So it's coming down into this ventricle right here. Okay, then the ventricle is gonna pump and force blood out through this vessel right here. And that on top there is the aorta. And that's gonna distribute the blood to the rest of the body. Okay, hopefully that was helpful. Right in the middle of the two chambers, uh, you can see that there's like a meaty bit in the middle. That is the septum of the heart. Uh, it's not supposed to have a hole in it. It does have a hole in it um, right when you're born, right just before you're born, um, because when you're in utero, uh, the blood actually just mixes between the left and the right ventricle because you don't use your lungs. So your lungs are, it, there's no blood being pumped through the pulmonary circuit because you aren't breathing. So, but once you're born, very quickly, that little hole in the septum will, will should, it should seal up, sometimes it doesn't, you have to have it surgically repaired, but uh, in general, it usually seals right up and then the, the septum gets built over top of it. The, uh, the septum is also really important for electrical conductivity in terms of how the, the heart actually functions, like how you make it pump in a coordinated way. We're gonna talk about that tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about the electrical activity in the heart tomorrow. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, let's see if we can get the magnifier on this. I want you to actually be able to see the fibers of heart muscle tissue. Yeah, you can see a little bit. You can see the muscle fibers. So you'll notice something about this. If you, if you examine all the fibers, you'll notice that they're not all running in the same direction. So here we've got them running left, right. And then as you kind of go around, they're all sort of pointing towards the center of the heart. In other words, you've got the fibers running like this. And the idea behind this is that this is not like a skeletal muscle, like here's one in your arm. 
the muscles in your arm, you just want them to get short in one direction, right? You just want the, mu the muscle might be this long, you want it to be this long so that you can like make your arm move or whatever. But in the heart, they're not all oriented in the same direction because you want the chamber to get smaller. It like squishes smaller in every direction. So that's why the, the muscle fibers are not all oriented in the same direction, like you would find them in a skeletal muscle. Uh, okay. Any questions about this? Do you want me to uh, bring this around if you want to take a closer look? I'm good. I can see it from here. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, anyone want a closer look at the heart? I won't, I won't put it right in your face or anything. I won't bring it right up to your nose. Don't worry. If you can see what it looks like, you can see the chordate in the hand, which is a bit better. <laughs> it smells a little bit bad, yeah. Sorry, it is in a preserve. Yeah. Oh, I can see. You would have done that to a This is slightly smaller than your heart. So maybe ten or fifteen percent. Yeah, I know. Approximately. Approximately. So you got one of these. Even if you do that with math college, so like really just get like how much smaller the aorta, like that's an aorta yeah. that's symmetrical. In the diagram, they're almost the same size. Yeah. So it's just, and you look at it, you're like, what the heck? It looks nothing like that. It's an LMAO. That's a one. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Anyone else want to take a closer look? Is that your book for me? Yeah. If you want some gloves, if anyone wants to take some gloves and probe around in this thing, pick it up. Feel free, I got gloves for it. You can see that in there. Put on some gloves. Oh. Anyone want to? Alicia. No, I don't. Oh. Sorry, I thought she was saying What's that? I stick my finger to the Yeah, absolutely. Come on. I have to do it. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have more gloves. To, this is uh, that's one thing we don't. We have lots of extras this year. Everybody's. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right, everyone's doing. You're looking for an art. Uh, oh, right. you're not. Yeah, he's not. Yeah. 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 No, he's alive, Trish. Yeah, How did he hear me? Because you're a live person. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, this is um, right ventricles going up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not like... I mean, it used to be a lot softer on that. It is. It's, it's a lot more softer. You can hear me say touch on the it's very misleading. I don't usually like yeah, to get the preserved heart, so I just didn't have a choice this year. So I normally get fresh ones. How many fetal pigs do we get on a normal year or this year? This year. This year I have two for the class. On a normal year we get five per section usually. We'll do one. We'll do one tomorrow. We'll do it as a group. You guys can do some cutting if you like. I'm supposed to save the second one in case the other class wants to try it when they come back. <laughs> Do you want to poke around too? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, you got gloves, so you're good. All right. So right here, it's like, how oh, thick is that just one of the veins, like the arteries, right, right down here? So this is collapsed a little bit, probably from the preservation process. That actually bows the other way out, usually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it's very thick and it's going like towards the back. Okay. Um, <laughs> this piece right here? Yeah, so this is... Uh, actually, there might be an abnormality in this one. That's bigger than normal. That's bigger than normal. There is a location and attachment point you can see for the chordate tendon. So there's the valve right there. But it's usually fairly small. This actually might be an abnormality of this one's heart. That's, a, that's bigger than normal. I think I'd be on the right side rather than the left side because this side's all meaty here. Oh, I, I, I get what you mean. Yeah. Anyway. Yep, just toss them in the trash. Yep. <laughs> no, okay, you can't tell that until, like, 
Anyone else before I uh, put this heart away? No, thank you. All right. I'm doing perfectly well. I, I've done fine my whole life without touching a heart. I'll, I'll just keep going. Have you ever gone to a heart? So, at UW, you take 10. Yeah, if you do the dissection lab that you do the first year, which is really cool. Um, and depending on the program, so there's other things. Yeah, I don't know why. It's not feeling good. So we used to take a field trip to U of G, and they they do one where you do some human dissection with parts of some whole human dissection. Um, but as far as I know, there's no program where you're going to get inside a person. It's, uh, there's a lot involved in it. It's a lot of like, things to study um, because people are donating their bodies for that purpose, and it's, it's usually pretty specific in terms of what they will let people do with their body. Yeah. It's not usually put on display for the public to come and poke them and stuff. So. <laughs> Somewhere. I'll come back for that. Put it back. It's full of vinegar. We used to have vinegar. We used to have vinegar. We're allowed to do that anymore. Alright, guys, just people at home, just give me two seconds here. I'm going to quickly clean up this equipment and then. It's actually worked pretty well. Could you, could you guys see that okay on the screen? I'm not even yeah. thinking. Oh, that's right. I didn't do it with my iPad last time, and that actually worked better than the webcam. Yeah, I can hear you on there, too. It's very faint. Yeah, it's still here. Okay. Just quickly look at what I how I plan this for today. I can remember the exact layout. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there. So, at this point, I'm going to give you the rest of this class to finish the, the questions that go along with this. Okay, so there's some analysis questions, page 481, number 1 to 3. 
and 486, 1, 2, 4, and 5. Uh, and then tomorrow, we're going to finish this note off. It just talks a little bit about the regulation of heart activity. How do you make your heart beat faster? How do you make it beat slower? Um, how does the heart coordinate a beat? Why are your heartbeats always the same? You know, we'll look at how to read an ECG, things like that. Okay, so we're going to start with that tomorrow. We'll finish off sort of the regulation of heart activity. Um, and then we'll do the fetal pig dissection. If people are interested in getting in the pig, you want to do some cutting, let me know. I'll grab you a pair of gloves, uh, and then you can take out the lungs or the heart or something like that. Um, just let me know what you're interested in, okay? I'm happy to accommodate people if people want to come up and do some cutting. And um, that, that's going to be our sort of summary of the systems. So we'll look at that circulatory, respiratory, and uh, digestive system. We'll do them one at a time and actually look to see what they look like in the pig. And uh, then you will have the rest of the class to work on the presentation at that point, on the medical technology presentation. Question? Yeah, just kind of in general. Have you ever had someone, like, mess up really badly with the pig dissection? Tell me more. Like, just, I don't know, like, cut off a foot. Or, like, not a foot, like, just... No, why would you... Like, like accidentally? Yeah. Foot. How do you accidentally cut it off? I don't know what I'm asking, like... It's very shaky in a slice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you're so shaky that you literally cut the wrong part of the pig off, uh, I would say you're, you're, you might not be able to safely use a, a scalpel at that point. I would be concerned. Uh, I will say, I have had a student cut their hand hold, holding a piece of fetal pig and cut like this, which is really silly. So you never ever cut towards your own flesh, obviously. But they had to get 10 stitches in their hand. So it was actually a really, really severe cut. They cut themselves all the way down their hand and it, it was just blood everywhere. It was that really sucks. bad. That was when I went to Grand River. Um, this is the worst, that's actually the worst injury I've ever had in my class. That uh, was very significant. <laughs> but uh, it was completely preventable, and I have no idea how it happened. But people do think sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so you guys have an opportunity to complete these questions. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about it.